Welcome to the Mother May I Podcast with Frank and Irene on Strong Island Entertainment. Gee, I hope I didn't make a mistake with these two. They promised me they'd bring in some really good guests. Well, anyway, here's Frank and Irene. And we are back at Mother May I Podcast with Mr. Frank Conniff and Irene Bremis. Frank, it's so nice to see you. You make me smile every single time. Nice to see you. You make me smile big time. So how's it going, Frank? How's it going in the world of, um, of, the, uh, of, of COVID? Are things uh, getting a little better in your neck of the woods? Or? Well, um, I don't know if in terms of COVID, if... Things are getting better. My mood is has been uh, it's been challenging for me because I don't know if you've seen my posts on social media, but my cat has been very sick. Oh my gosh, um, I'm so sorry, Millie. Uh, she had a major operation, and uh, she's back from the hospital. She seems to be doing well, but you know I have this thing with her where I, where I have to give her medication and stuff, mm. and I have to feed her through a tube in her neck sometimes, mm. and um, and uh, it annoys. She doesn't go psycho on me when I do it, but she mm-hmm. she gets annoyed, and then she's like, "Well, fuck you. We're not friends anymore." And she goes into the closet and hides for like hours, and I, it kind of makes me sad. Uh, you know? that is, she, then, she like later, she yeah. she comes out and hangs out and lets me pet her and stuff, and everything is cool between us. But then when I have to give her her medicine. It's it like ruins everything, and I, there's a part of me that's just like, I, I just want to stop giving her the medicine, but I know that's not the good thing. I know I've got right. to keep keep taking care of her. Well, that's you because know. you're kind and you don't want her to suffer. It's ironic, like you've almost come full circle. She took care of you when you were sick. Now yes. you're taking care of her when she's sick. Except you weren't hiding under the bed when she was sitting yes. next to you. Okay, so maybe we need to. I wasn't, back and she's back. um yeah she's. And I actually closed off my bedroom so she can't get into it because that has like all the really good hiding places. So she found a place in the closet in my hallway where she sits and stuff. And she, if she feels secure there, I'm okay with it. Let her sit there. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't try to uh, influence her one way or the other, but, um, but she is getting better and she, you know, uh, she does like kind of feel like she's getting back to normal, which is good. That's great. You know, Millie, um, and like most cats, like when my cat was really, really sick, they like to hide. They like to isolate a little bit. Like right. my cat was often went into a corner underneath the bed, you know, while she, yeah. she didn't want to be around people. That's not the cat way. You know, they like to. Isolate. No, no. Yeah. Well, my, you know, actually, uh, it's my way. I like to go under the bed and isolate when I'm feeling a little bad too. I'm, so that's. I'm the same way. <laughs> um, and uh, Millie, the thing is, is before she got sick, I, I hate to say this about her, but uh, like the pandemic was like kind of a golden age for her. She was loving it because she she seemed very peaceful mm-hmm. and like nobody ever came over to our house. Mm-hmm. So she loves that. Nobody was was bothering us. Mm-hmm. Um, she just had me. Uh, to like, herself, came, Frank, to, to herself to for the first time. To herself. Yeah. And she was she was digging it a lot and she still digs it. But... <clears throat> But then she got she got sick and had to have an operation to remove a uh, stone inside of her. So mm. um, it was pretty serious. But um, oh boy! You know, so it, it kind of you know it ruined the d- pandemic for her, which sucks. Yeah, she was loving a, it. She was loving the pandemic, yeah. and, you know, and, st- <laughs> and stones are so damn painful, Frank. They're yes, so they painful, are. You know so. So Poor it's good thing. that they got it out, and yeah, and she feels yeah. she feels a lot better, and and um, I'm trying to get her to eat more. Um, I, I have to, if she doesn't eat, I have to feed her through the tube, which she doesn't like, and I don't like, you know. So um, I just gave her like an uh, an appetite medication today, so hopefully oh. that'll. Help. Really? Okay, that's exactly yeah. what I don't need. Is that like weed for the cat? Like so she can get I, it, it's, it, it'll it? give her it give her gives her munchies, hopefully. Yeah. You know. Okay. Right. So does she have any diet restrictions now because of the stones? Well, they it- have this like liver um cat food that they want her to eat, but they told me it was okay to feed her her old like um, you know, um fancy feast or whatever. 
because she likes it. So as long as she's eating, she's fine. They would prefer it if she ate the kind of special food that they have mm-hmm. for her. But that's that's I mix that in with a blend, and that's what I give her when I um when I feed her through the tube. But yeah, it's as it's far like as can- eating, and I, and I I had a can of tuna fish too, which I. I gave her some of that, and she likes that, you know. Mm-hmm. But that's not you. That can't be her regular diet, though. That can't be her regular. Well, it sounds like you've got things covered. You know what? Fancy feast because she's fancy. It's sort of like, uh, and then putting in the good stuff. That mixture reminds me of like putting a piece of kale on a Big Mac. You know, she's. I'm sure. uh, that <laughs> would be her. so wrong. That would be so wrong. I know for the Big Mac, exactly. Yes, of course. Um, well, Frank, I'm glad. I, I, I've been kind of pulling away from social media, but the minute I saw that Millie was in trouble, Frank, I was just like, oh my God, look at Frank. Now he's dealing with Millie. It seems like you've had a really rough time. First Barney, now Millie. You know, Barney, my other cat, Barney, died a few a couple months ago, you know, and um, so I'm just grateful that, um, that uh, she's alive and... Um, you know, and it's costing me a fortune, which sucks. I can't tell. I, I, you know, I'm paying more money for her than I paid on my own, uh, upper, my own heart surgery. I'm not kidding because I had insurance Crazy. for as, as however, like kind of not quite adequate that my insurance was. At least mm-hmm. I had insurance. Mm-hmm. This um, uh, Millie is like completely bankrupting me with her. With She's her bankrupting insurance. you. Uh, yeah. yeah. Tell me, isn't there such a thing as cat insurance, Frank? There is, insurance? but there, it would be too late for me to get it for her now because she's a pre-existing. Uh, she falls. She's, she's blanketed. Pre-existing. She's. Condition. I think the technical term for her is pre-existing conditions, like a motherfucker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so um, they, they. So for her, but if I ever like get a kitten or something like this time around, for sure I would get I would get insurance. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, you know, because you know yeah. we we don't think about it, but then you know it is. I hear it over and over again, and I've experienced it myself. When you have a pet, they become mm-hmm. your family. They're the only people you have, and we never foresaw a fucking pandemic happening. You have your pet. You want to keep your pet healthy, and all of a sudden, yeah, this happens, and we're already bankrupt through this experience, and now you're being further bankrupted through. Yeah. These medical bills for Millie. Anyway, Frank, we love you. We're praying for Millie. Yay. I, I love Millie, even though she never comes out when you I never You never officially met her when you, all the times she came and visited me when I was sick, she never met anybody. Nobody ever saw her because yeah. um, it was it was a big freak out for her to have all those people coming over. But Barney was around all the time. Everybody met Barney, oh, but not Barney. Millie. Yeah, but yeah. Millie's a little bit more reserved. Anyway, we're yeah. praying for Millie for a swift recovery, not only to Melly, but to your bank account, Frank, because I understand this is serious money that's being paid. Right, right. Oh, man. Okay. So, Frank, um, the person that we have coming on the show today, I'm really excited that she's going to be on this show because she's somebody that definitely doesn't normally do this kind of stuff. So I had to rope her into this shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Will you please do this? Um, She is um, one of the most, I want to say... Uh, the most influential sculptures and artists of our time. Quite, quite literally, she's one of the most fascinating women I've ever known. I've known her for 30 years. She um, wow. also named Rachel Feinstein, not to be confused with Rachel Feinstein. And we might have to talk about that little story because we all know each other. Um, I introduced them uh, when I first started doing comedy. Uh, Rachel is most notably known for Baroque, fantasy-inspired, um, like the Snow Queen, which is what my husband calls me, actually. Uh, actually <laughs> the Snow Blowing Queen before we got married. It's a very sad thing for him. Which was drawn, <laughs> which was drawn a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale and countless other works that I've been privileged to see throughout the years and most recently went to the opening of her latest show, Maiden Mother Crone at the Jewish Museum, which uh, is a retrospective. Actually, they can't call it a retrospective because she's too young, so they call it survey, which sounds kind of douchey, mm-hmm. like they're still judging her somehow. But um, this is uh, this is a show that I, I I'm so grateful that I got to see. And then I actually went to a personal walkthrough with Rachel Dratch and Amy Poehler, which was absolutely mind blowing. I want to bring this woman on. You're gonna love her just as much as I love her. She's absolutely incredible. Let's bring her on, the lovely Rachel Feinstein Curran, everybody. Rachel, 
Feinstein Curran. Hello, my love. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> I'm outside in Maine right now. Wow, lucky you. Yeah. That seems that sounds great. It's glorious. Oh, and your doggie's there. Hi. Hi. Rachel, You've already been talking about pets for the whole show so far, so this is appropriate. Rachel, meet Mr. Frank Conniff, who was also Hi. Hi, how are you? He's Mr. Green. His name is Mr. Green Jeans. I know. Oh, I love that. Yes, yeah. Rachel, how old is Mr. Green Jeans by he, now? This is crazy. He's going to be seven. He's my, remember, remember Chewy was my first one. So they're Affen Ventures, which are called monkey dogs in German. And, um, and they look a lot like Chewbacca from kind of, um, you know, or actually they look more like Ewoks. You know, they have these crazy yeah. weird faces and... So um, he's the second one. The first one lived to be thirteen, and he's mm -hmm. seven. So I hope he. Lasts oh, he's got a he's got a long way to go. He's got a long way to go, and he's the luckiest goddamn pet on the planet he living is. with you. Okay, he he's is. spoiled. He in fact, some, he's a main. Here, I'm going to turn this around just so you yeah. get a view of wow. what I'm. Oh, I'm. I have. I have. Uh, I have jealous. deep. I have deep main envy right now. It's pretty crazy here. I mean, yeah. it's just. We've been coming up here for, um, I mean, I came here first in 1993, right before I met you, Irene. Oh I was here God. for an artist colony called Skowhegan, and it's a famous um, artist colony that was founded in the 1950s. I think, um, God, I don't know, a lot of the big time greats started this as a way for New York artists to come up here mm -hmm. and have this kind of peace and quiet that you need to make art as an artist, mm -hmm. you know, because New York is awesomeness and yeah. amazing to, to, to right. focus and to work, but you need this time out, which is what this whole, this totally quiet here. Well, it's interesting how, how close, that. how close is your uh, closest neighbor? I mean, so we're surrounded by this huge park called Acadia. So uh -huh. on this house that we bought um, is grandfathered in from 1962 that mm -hmm. has the park around it. So we have nothing at all across the way, but we wow. do have one or two people on each side of us, probably about... I don't know, an acre away. It's not, it's not. Oh, totally wow. Remote. Are they wearing masks, Rachel? Seriously. <laughs> you know, Maine, Maine has very few cases and people wear masks when they go shopping. But then when you're on a trail or you're walking, there's just no one really around you. So yeah, there's crazy. no need. And wow. It's, I envy that a lot. It feels very, um, peaceful, very wonderful and normal to be here because mm -hmm. of that. And I'm very grateful because, we're coming back to New York next week, so it's it's kind of the end of this of this period of, of a bubble mm -hmm. of normalcy because mm -hmm. obviously that's not going to last very long. It's not going to last. Right. This is you know a yeah. place that you can be quiet. Well, for, uh, Rachel, I was just telling Frank about going to your show and how grateful I am that I caught your show before Corona struck down and closed. And I'm upset. I'm still upset because I was going to come to that final. You know. But that final event with Sofia Coppola. So they kept it open. So my show is actually has become like a fairy tale enc encased in a glass coffin as well. The show is going to be open again um, when the museums open, which are it's happening right now. And mm -hmm. I think it's going to be open to the public um, until January 3rd. So they wow. never closed it. So They never I'm closed it, no. We can do a couple more events if it's allowed. We don't know mm -hmm. what's going to happen at this point. Everything's up in the air. But it would have been great to do that um, That lady's incredible kind of lecture with Florence Welch. And, I was um, really looking Coppola forward to it. Mm -hmm. And Tamara Jenkins and Lisa Scavage. We were going to talk about the idea of like whether a woman artist needs a narrative Mm -hmm. more than a male artist the idea of you have a story or kind of some kind of thing that catches your 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 fancy you know that's that's kind of fascinating the idea of a narrative in in a visual in visual art it's not the kind of thing that those of us who are just um who just look at art we, we don't think about that that often so i yeah. think it's really interesting the idea of, of, of a narrative in, i mean in for me i absolutely need it when i mm -hmm. um I'm asked to do a show, even the Jewish Museum, when they asked me to do the show, I, it, and I knew it was going to be bits and pieces from my whole history of making art, but I mm -hmm. kind of thought, um, 
I needed a hook. I always need mm-hmm. something to get me excited. And and I think I was so focused on fairy tales my whole life. And yes. as, when I was in college, because mm-hmm. it's the story that brings you in. And then when you're in there and you're and you're kind of into what's happening, you don't realize that you're learning things. You're it's it's the whole reason why fairy tales exist for children. It's the mm-hmm. version of teaching you about good and evil and about doing the right thing and morality. And it's always been something for me that is very focused on little girls more than little boys in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways. And, and I became obsessed as, um, as a, you know, student at Columbia university about the stories of the real life sleeping beauty and things before brothers Grimm got to them because Mm -hmm. I also was a religion major and there's a lot of thought that, um, Lilith was this idea of the first Eve, you yes. know, the whole thing that goes. The incubus. So, I mean, a succubus. Sorry. Excuse exactly. Me. Well, she was the she was the loudmouth Jewish wife that wouldn't basically be be put in her place, like Eve ended up becoming. And then people believe that she was actually rewritten out of the Bible mm-hmm. by mm-hmm. men who came in later and decided we want to reread everything, mm-hmm. rewrite everything, and so. I think it's the same thing with fairy tales. The ones that we, as girls, watch with um, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White from Disney Worlds and all that kind of stuff. And Disney, it was very focused on this idea of a girl being woken up by a man's kiss. And the original mm-hmm. stories are absolutely nothing to do with that. They're no, and that's why, that's why I will never forget, like, the, the, just seeing your first installation that you did, yeah. remember, when you, I think what the exhibit was at Exit Art. Was it Exit it Art? Was. It, it was. was. Exit Art, where you had Sleeping Beauty, and, and it was going up and down, and she was violently yeah. being pounded. Yes. Yeah. Pounded by, this, I, by the castle I, on top of her, just exactly. going like Exactly. And it's so symbolic. And that's what I really love about your work, Rachel. I want to talk about some of the stuff that really struck me when I went to your show. It was just, and and Frank, I told Frank, I don't know if you remember me saying this, Frank, but I definitely want to take you to see this. So we should go to the- Oh, absolutely. I'll meet you guys there. Yeah, I would love it. Oh, great, great. It was a personal walkthrough. I already told Frank about this a while back. I don't know if he remembers, but he's going to absolutely adore it because he's, he thinks in terms of this anyway. And, um, so, but when I saw some of the sculptures that you did that were taken from little figurines, Frank, she had like these little things that were figurines of these mm-hmm. women that were from um, Victoria's Secrets models. And then they had like these botched sort of like deformed faces. And this really spoke to me. I wonder if you get like all these different interpretations from people, how they view your work. For me, it was very powerful in the wake of what's going on with the media yes. treatment, with um, what's going on with misogyny, with yes. uh, Black Lives Matter, everything that's going yes. on with the marginalized people and, and, yes. and yes. inequality. Absolutely. I see these women and I see how their bodies are being exploited, but how they are broken and they yes. are just... They're yeah. tired and they're they're faceless and they're they don't have an identity anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. that the well the whole thing started with this mother maiden maiden mother crone idea of the, of the show because I had um, looked at this book at the Strand that was called Maze Madonna's Witches and it was a book that was done in the early sixties late fifties by a bunch of men um, using the source of women as the theme in art history. So it was um, sculptures by Picasso to the Venus de Willendorf talking about the female form. Mm-hmm. But they were all, it was all written and photographed by men with Henry Miller and E.E. E. Cummings, all these major guys. Mm-hmm. And they basically, um, and I just realized, you know, women have to always stand up to this kind of critique. Uh, no matter who we are and what we do, I mean, I was watching the Democratic National Convention and analyzing whether Michelle Obama had filler work done. And I never thought that about, right. you know, about any of the men that were talking. Exactly. It's this, it's this Except for Jared in, Kushner. He's got it's some work done. It's a ingrained <laughs> thing in our brains. And I just yeah. have always wondered... Like, why did that happen? And and when did that get set up? Because it's just such a fascinating, and also this experience of being in COVID right now. Mm-hmm. All my friends who, you know, have these big families are just, they've been put back into like 
the dark ages with mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. cooking and cleaning and, right. and slaving away. And these are people that are CEOs of companies or they, you know, they're, they're major agents and this, and it's, it's just the most bizarre thing. Like, why does this happen? There's some biology to this. There is or, some, or, or some road comic that hates to cook and clean for the God's sake. I just keep wondering, there's got to be some reason to it. It's not mm -hmm. completely from our time. And it's not based on society. It has to be based on something else. And I'm just trying to figure it out. And so the whole thing with like, I, when I was in my teens in Miami growing up in the eighties, I modeled and I, I saw basically, you know, this, it wasn't for me, it was about being a girl or a young woman modeling because I was doing stuff with Bruce Weber and he was doing the Calvin Klein obsession ads. And for that, for him, it was really about the beautiful man versus the mm -hmm. beautiful woman. So right. I, I just watched it as an idea of people using youth. Youth. That's right. And these older people sucking the, the, the young blood for their own, <laughs> their own reasons and i um oh john's listening john, <laughs> come, come, over. Come, say come say hello john oh my god they're talking about he's me, like quit talking, talking about me older people <laughs> sucking the life out of They're young like, women mr john curran <laughs> hi john hey. john john is an john, thanks for popping in by the way Talk about the power couple, Mr. John Kern, who's a legendary artist. I mean, come on. And, and Bradgelina, my butt. Am I right? This is the power couple. Those two are divorced. These two are forever. I'm like the Scott Baio of, of, of power couples. <laughs> oh, no. oh, my goodness. Wow. So he's, so you're, you're Chachi and she's Joni. Okay. Yeah, you're Chachi and Joni. Joni. Yes, that's what he said. Yes, absolutely. You're cracking him up, Frank, like you always do, buddy. Oh, my God. That was amazing. I love he that. He always does his finger, that guy. He always just has something really funny to say. He's very funny, John. He's yes, a Virgo. Yes. Let Frank, Frank do it. I know you want to. Yes. Frank always does this when I come. <laughs> it's a Virgo. I know you had a birthday. Frank's birthday is on Sunday, right, sweetie? Your birthday next is next week. This oh, coming Sunday. Week. Okay. So, and when is John's birthday again? I don't know. I have to. He's ask. September nineteenth. Oh, okay. So that's He's coming. That's coming up too. So you're, yeah, you're a Virgo, a Virgo too, then, He's right? Mr. Virgo yes, Virgo. I am. That's right, because yep. that's coming totally. up. Oh my God, I haven't even thought about what day of the week it is or anything oh good and it's better that way but you know what let me let me pedal back to what you were saying about the uh the yes. dnc and how people yes. were sitting there scrutinizing michelle yes. uh, first of all yes. michelle obama's speech blew me out of the water yes. she is yes. so, yes. so elegant so well stated so amazing so just yes. she's remarkable right yes. but the fact that we're doing that is because everybody has to take a woman down. And if you could find yeah. some flaw with her, in some way, you're revealing that she's a liar. She's fa yeah. You're falsifying her, you know? And if you do this, then you're discrediting, it, you're discrediting her yeah. somehow. And yeah. that's what we do. That's why you're, you're sculptors. And I want to ask you, what was the deeper meaning for those beautiful, larger well, than life? It's an interesting thing because uh -huh. for me, when I was, so there's, you know, this William, William, you know, Willem de Kooning, this incredible abstract expressionist from the sure. 1950s, 60s. He made these. My he, mom, my mom knew him. Oh, he's, wow. he's like one of yeah. my, I think he's incredible. He's mm -hmm. a hero. And he came over here, you know, as an immigrant and, um, and really invented himself from a completely different past. And that's when America, for me, was at its absolute brightest, was that you could be somebody from another country, move to New York City, that was New York City at the moment, you know, where you can just become an abstract expressionist painter and make things that never existed and no one ever saw that stuff before. Mm -hmm. And for him, his famous thing were called the Violent Women Series. They were paintings of a figure that was a woman, but it was really super aggressive and lots of splotches of colors. And so that was actually the inspiration artistically was, for the women. Okay. How do you take that image that a man has made as a painting and turn it around as a sculpture? You know, and I'm a total sculptor. I love, so sculpture itself is so different than painting because it is its own body. So you are confronted by its own, the vortex of this, of this object. And it, it has its own kind of gravitational pull and it really makes you feel either small or big or, or a woman or a man and paintings, you lose who you are 
and in your world and you fall into this magical mystical world behind the painting mm -hmm. so it's all about a fantasy world in your own head and you lose your body so right. um so those those one those women are so physical and they've always been about um the way victoria's secret shows make me feel as i've watched them over the mm -hmm. years and i made those little small versions that you've seen in the show in 2015 so before the me too thing started mm -hmm. i started to make those and that's also the important thing that now that i'm nearing 50 that I've realized all these years that... And I hope I'm invited to your party, yeah, sweetie. Oh, let's see if we want. Else? One. My God, with this... Where now, talk about John. i got to interrupt for five seconds just to yeah, tell yeah. Frank about the last two birthday parties. First of all, where else can I go to a birthday party and be standing next to Mick Jagger and then yeah. do karaoke with him? These guys. <laughs> Rachel wow, and you, John. Uh, you Mick never, Jagger. You never, told me about, you never told me about that. It's yeah. crazy. Standing right yeah. next to Mick Jagger. But yeah. furthermore, John, who's like... And, 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 and and I don't, I don't want to start thinking about this because Steve won't, won't get me roses because he says that I'm allergic and I am. But come on, Steve, step up your fucking game a little bit. John here, for a milestone birthday, rented out this big thing and recreated a casino for Rachel yeah. with fake printed money. And yes. Rick, Chrissy, another girl that we know, we yes. actually um, gambled against uh, John McEnroe. He was gambling at the table yeah. to add that low cut and he was staring at my titties. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> yes. He wow. And he lost. Chrissy won. He, she beat him. And I have that collaborative work that I'm so grateful that I have. I, I have that, that sketch. We're going to be making a book of those, so I'm going to have to get it photographed, okay. by the way. Yes, Glad absolutely. No that. problem. Yeah, Rizzoli is going to do a book on our, on those drawings that we've been doing together. Well, so, Well, here's how I negotiate. I'll I give know. you a <laughs> sign it oh what you want to play hardball we, we've signed it before it's not signed oh my god yes we have to absolutely, absolutely. oh i can retire now how nice <laughs> how nice uh, so yeah. one of the things that i want to talk about because rachel i just want you i love you and john so much you're my favorite you. couple in the world i am i really unabashedly say that yeah, i love you you're both so generous the only thing that's bigger than your talents is your hearts. Like, you're amazing. And the way that they got together, Frank, please tell us the story. I want everybody to hear okay. the okay. remarkable okay. union. Cool. I'm getting the sun hitting me. I'm going to move over this way a little bit. So basically, when John and I, so Irene met me right before I met John. So I graduated from Columbia in 93, and then I did this artist colony up in Maine. And then I did this show, um, and, and then I met Irene in 94, or like early 94, I think March of 94 it was, um, was when Bar 6 opened, and I hired her to be a fabulous um, waitress, and we would have the most fun. We had this crazy, crazy time at this job with Chrissy and a whole crew that we're all still good friends with. And That's um, when you needed a headshot to be a waitress. Oh, my it? God, yes. <laughs> oh, absolutely. It was, it was absolutely all about that. And we would have different outfits that we would work every night. Someone would wear something, and then it. sometimes I would always change. Oh, my God. Know. Rachel would come oh, yeah. in. And you know what, Rachel? This speaks to your work. You know, when I yeah. think about your intrepidity through the years i'm not surprised that you took yeah. the monumental risks that you take in your yeah. work because i think that's just who you are and i think that's yeah. what you achieved to be frank takes a lot of risks in his comedy he's very that's smart fantastic. he's very funny he always pushes boundaries hey he's i take i take risks in my in the way i dress too that's come awesome. on that's awesome <laughs> well the truth is is that i think the only way anything will change is if you take that big right. leap of faith and it's right. always about yeah. that and you ha and everybody like i like to kuning i was talking about you mm. have to just the fact they got on a boat came to new york you know you have to do something that's scary to well push even people. even uh, for you i would imagine just the idea of having a career and succeeding yeah. In the world of art, I mean, that's an incredible leap of faith. Because I wouldn't even know how you would go about that. It's yeah. it's all about the faith that you're going to make something True. that people are going to respond to, and you're going to be able to um, have a livelihood from it. And it's yeah. it's you you sort of have to have a uh, be a little bit naive about it when you're starting Absolutely. out, don't you? Absolutely, and it's the same thing with comedy. I think there are two worlds. Yeah. I've been reading this. There are two worlds that are so crazy and people do not understand. Like, how do you even go about even doing something like that? And my right. parents mm -hmm. 
came from my dad was a doctor he was like first generation american the idea of me saying i'm going to be an artist they're like no you're not you're going yeah. to I, I was i'm marrying john kern yes you are yeah <laughs> okay. I, I don't want to get off the beaten okay. path because we're running out of time and i'm so okay let me tell the story let, yeah okay go. let me tell the story really quick so basically i was doing this show that um that irene was mentioning called let the artist live where i was living in this castle like gingerbread house that I constructed and a man came over to me at the opening. I had white platinum hair and I'd wear latex dresses. I was nothing like I look like right now. I was a complete crazy like um like you know I don't know I look like a white goth John said I had this white hair that was all messed white. up and I'd wear all these white clothes that were always dirty and ripped up and torn and this guy came to, and I also used to wear fake pubic wigs. Yeah that's, uh, you can't see I know. it. We hate our low production I would, I would wear like see-through clothes and then wear a giant black pubic hair merkin coming out of my underwear. I was totally insane. And this guy comes over to me and goes, you look like a John Curran painting. And I had never heard of John Curran. And I said, that's great, whatever. I walked away. He was wearing black leather jeans, a black leather vest, and a full black leather coat. Quite and the hottie early September with elevator boots. And I was like, what is the story with that guy? And I got kind of heebie-jeebied out and he kept calling me on the payphone of this gallery because I had to live there for six weeks and he would always get me and I'd be like, oh, it's him again. And I kind of hang up. And then he called up John from the white pages and said, there's this beautiful girl. She looks Dating like one of yourself. your paintings. Yeah. And she's a good friend of mine. And and he, he didn't know me and I, and I didn't know him and he didn't know John. He just happened to somehow put us together john walked into the gallery i saw him i walked over to him and yes of course john's over there saying, Is it okay? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of and then i and then i kissed him half on the lips and half on the cheek because i was a little bit uh, shy but also strong and then he kind of was like are you rachel and i said yep and that was that and then about a week later i'm with him in his house in his unloft on a house in an A, and we're deep in love. We're already talking about marriage and the whole crazy thing. And he then says, um, you know, let's go to Paris together. I'm having a show. And I said, sure. That guy I called, his name is Timothy. Oh, the dog's coughing. <laughs> his name is Timothy. And I said, um, John picks up, hi, Timothy. I just want to say thank you so much. I'm so in love. It's incredible. And Timothy goes, I've got another girl and she's even better. That's the real story. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say, John? And she has black hair. That's what the story was. Wow, we never know. Wow. This day oh we don't God. know who that other girl is oh and what happened God. to her. But isn't that well, crazy? Yeah. Do you, you want to come to me, uh, with me to Paris for my opening? It's yep. kind of a good, good line, I have to it say. Yeah. It and then I went to Paris with him a week later. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, and then he asked me to marry him in Paris. And I said, wow. I said I, I'm going to marry you and I'm going to have your children. But you they have to meet three my family in Miami first because I'm a good Jewish girl. So he had to fly down <laughs> to Miami after <laughs> that. And then we got married a couple of two and a half, three years later, and Irene came to the wedding. Oh, it was the best oh, nice. wedding ever, ever. It was amazing. It, it was, was amazing. Old, the old parrot jungle down in Coral Gables. We got married in the flamingo pit with all the, oh, the flamingos around us. And it was a very, very cool. And it I was, had synchronized swimmers. Oh, I had, my God. I, yes, that's right. <laughs> Who has synchronized swimmers at their goddamn wedding, Rachel? But, Frank, <laughs> wait till you see... And we're so running out of time, and this is killing me because Rachel, I didn't even get to cancel culture. There's so many other things that I want to talk to you about. I will die. So I would love for you to do this again, like a part I would, two. I yes, would, please, please. I would love that. I I'm going to bring Frank to your show. And Frank, you would not believe when I say that John Curran's paintings were Rachel. Yeah. breathing and living you wouldn't yeah. believe it like this was it, such so meant yeah. to be if you it is so that. so weird so, life is that way we're gonna be okay let's just remember that we're gonna be okay because i think there is some kind of strange master plan i really do uh -huh. believe that i'm I'm a big believer I, i'm i'm with you i'm with you, I'm on, with that. you on that too. Yeah. So a lot of twists and a lot of twists and turns in that yeah. master plan. A lot exactly. of adversity, but exactly. you gotta then, gotta keep the faith and make it through it. I totally That's agree. Right, and maybe by all of this, yeah. it's gonna be in, like like a bigger and better phoenix coming out of the ashes right now. You know, I, I, I want to believe that, and I I believe that in my heart. I really do. Yeah. 
I believe too. that is true in my heart. But um, Rachel, so I want to take Frank. When yeah. you're back, maybe you can meet us at the Jewish Museum. I would love that. And I, I would think he that. would thoroughly enjoy it. It's right near you, Frank. Wait, where is it? The Jewish 92nd Museum? 92nd between 5th and Madison. Oh, oh, that's totally near me. That's that's my hood, basically. Fabulous. It's a, it's, yeah. a it's a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood. So I'll come love. pick him up, and then we'll we'll go and, uh, and check out Rachel's show. Rachel, I just want you to know, and everybody that's watching this, I want you to know that I'm going to be posting the links to not only her work, but also to the Jewish Museum. If you want to go and check out this show, it is remarkable. We didn't get to a lot of the stuff that I wanted to talk to you again, because I love okay. you, and I just I wanted to you. talk to you. You know what I, I mean? I love you. I love seeing um, you. So I love seeing you. Thank Great you. to meet you. Thank you so much for doing this. We love you so much, you. and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Awesome. Bye, John. Bye, John. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye, brilliant artists in the Bye. woods of Maine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. 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 Thanks for tuning in to the Mother May I podcast with Frank and Irene on Strong Island Entertainment. Check us out next week when Frank and Irene sit down with, you know what, I don't know what these two are going to do next, but we'll see you next week. <laughs>